Okay, welcome everybody. This is our Ask the Experts about Rude Beckia. I am Diane Blazik. I am the Executive Director of All America Selections and National Garden Bureau, your host for this webinar. So to get started, what I was thinking first is um, because it's the year of the Rude Beckia, you know, we want to promote all the different types of Rude Beckia, um, perennial and others. And so I don't want to go too much into that because I want our experts to explain that. So let's have our experts in turn maybe um, talk about some of the different types of Rudbeckia and how many different species are there. I think it, I think we'll be surprised at how many there are. So who wants to start with that question to start talking about the different types of Rudbeckia? I can jump in. Um, there's a lot just for starters. Uh, you talk about species. I think there's at least 20 or maybe, maybe 23 different species of Rudbeckia. And so those genetics cover a wide range. You have everything from giant, tall, um, native ones to ones that are more bred to be compact and, and fit better into a container. Uh, there's both seed and vegetative uh, varieties within those species. So really a broad offering in Rudbeckia. Awesome. Um, Marcus, and while there's you... a, a broad offering in Rudbeckia, I'd say there's maybe just about a handful that we see commonly used in the industry or that you'll be able to find um, either from seed, from, from cuttings or from, from your local garden centers. And so I'd say Rudbeckia hirta and Rudbeckia fulgida are maybe two of the ones that you'll see the most. Um, I'm a gardener here in the upper Midwest in zone 5A. So to me, a hirta is more of a, an annual type Rudbeckia, whereas fulgidas and some of these other perennial types that we'll talk about are maybe ones that have a little more longevity as perennials. And that's a good point is, of course, you know, everyone should know their growing zone. And because some of the answers and some of the types that will grow or be perennials or be annuals are going to be different in your growing zone. So we will ask our panelists to kind of interject throughout today's uh, webinar. OK, you know, this may be a statement, but if you're in zone nine, you know, it might be different. So so we will try to accommodate the different ones. Um, now, here's one of the questions. If I grow several types of open pollinated varieties and wish to save seed, will the seed come true or will they easily cross? I, I can speak to this because we do a lot with the seed breeding. Um, you know, most, actually all of our seed Rudbeckia varieties are open pollinated breeding. So yes, you will get some variability when that occurs. You can make selections to try and hone in on the characteristics you want to, to keep. Um, but ultimately they are going to open pollinate with each other, the different plants, and they are going to produce uh, seeds that have some variability. It's all in the selection process, how you minimize that variability. But, but all of ours are open pollinated genetics. Excellent. Um, how long do Rudbeckia seeds generally remain viable? I guess it depends how you store them. So <laughs> maybe give some advice. Yeah, I'd have to check on that, honestly. Um, I, I know they have a decent shelf life, things like in, in patients, you know, you get up to a year in, in storage and you'll start to see things like the germination drop off. I, I don't think that's the case with Rebecca. It may be that they have a, a couple years shelf life, but I'd really have to verify that they, the seed should last um, at least a couple years though. Right, and if we think about how these plants are uh, adapted as species, right? These prairie plants, these woodland plants that live in the seed bed for years and years and years, you'd be surprised how long some of this seed can last. Here at our breeding station, we were rummaging through some old seed and we found some that was maybe 20 year old seed germinated just fine. So while like some of the seed you might get on the market may label a shelf life of three to five years, something like that, you can sometimes expect more and more out of this genus of Rudbeckia. Excellent. Okay, so um, I think this question will be for the two breeders on our panel. So Marcus and Scott, can you tell us some of the new breeding that you're working on? Like what are the traits in a Rudbeckia that you want to enhance or you want to improve? Yeah, well, um, for us, certainly a lot of our focus is with the, the seed breeding. Um, we're, we're trying to create new seed varieties of Rudbeckia. 
And um, some of the different attributes we're going for are like new and different colors, um, different flower forms. So there's, there's different types of things like tubular flowers and, and other flower forms besides the typical look of a Rebecca. Um, and then of course we like, you know, more compact types that would fit better into a container or that could be used as, as a combination plant. Um, we're, we're looking in kind of all of those areas, but also into the hardiness. Um, we're trying to create uh, uh, more hardy varieties, uh, varieties that would be true perennials and, and not um, quite such a tender perennial, um, would maybe make it up into the zones uh, four and higher. Um, so we're looking into all of those directions with our current breeding. Yeah, and while, while Benari like plays into this very nicely in this Rudbeckia heritage space, I think we're focusing a little bit more on Fulgidas, some more of these cold hardy perennials, um, and trying to figure out like what are the issues, what are we trying to solve with this breeding? So we've heard a lot of issues with disease and pest problems on Rudbeckia, or also how late they are to flower, and also that most of the Rudbeckia on the market are very comparable in the fact that they're yellow flowering in a mound. So how can we bring in different forms, different textures <laughs> into our gardens, and just give you more of a palette to work from with just, just within Rudbeckia? So that's what we're challenged with our breeder, Valerie, based here in Elburn, Illinois. She's, she's been running with perennial Rudbeckia programs. Very nice. So I think now um, let's talk about some of the different varieties, Rudbeckia. We have a PowerPoint up. Um, these are just a few of the many varieties that we have featured in our year of program. And um, so I will just go through each slide and we'll have one of our panelists jump in and talk about that variety. Okay, Amarillo Gold seems to be the first one up, so I'll jump in here. Um, this is Benari breeding. This is really our flagship Rudbeckia variety for commercial production. Um, what's so great about Amarillo Gold is you get this giant flower with the nice green eye, um, and you get that flower on, on a more compact plant. So typically Rudbeckias can get rather large, and for a grower that can be challenging to keep that large plant contained in a pot. So this, this particular variety is really good at that. You get great flower power and a great show of color, but in a small package. And it's an AS winner, right? <clears throat> Absolutely, it's, it's got great performance and with those huge flowers outdoors really puts on a show, um, whether it's in the ground or in a container. You can always rely on me to bring up that AAS winter portion. <clears throat> and here's one that I wanted to talk about, American Gold Rush. So this is not a seed propagated variety. It's a vegetatively propagated variety. <clears throat> Sorry. And this won um, the AAS award in 2019. So it is a perennial variety and you can see the mounding habit of it. And um, one of the big things that the judges talked <clears throat> talked about was the disease resistance. It doesn't get the spot on the leaves. Now, the other thing about American Gold Rush, we've been promoting this as a triple crown of horticulture. And the reason is because it's an AS winner and this year is the year of the Rudbeckia and the Perennial Plant Association has named it their perennial of the year. So you got three things going for this one. And next, Autumn Colors. Okay, so this is another seed Rudbeckia from Benari, and this one is more on the vigorous side. This is really an older, more classic variety, really great in the garden. Uh, a lot of people really love these for the color it brings uh, in, in the late summer and fall months. You get all of those, you know, autumn colors that are they're going to really show well that time of year. Um, it does have a lot of rustic shades, and you will get a lot of color play from flower to flower on the same plant. So really an interesting uh, variety with kind of these unique autumn, autumn tones. Yeah, those are gorgeous colors. Okay, next up, Blackjack Gold. 
And yeah, while blackjack gold is not a Pan American seed variety, this is one that I've actually gardened with and seen in trials before. Uh, and blackjack is uh, Rebecca trilobum, another mm -hmm. species get together, a species that is hold a pretty wide hardiness range, zone three to zone nine. Um, and this is a big, robust plant. If you're used to some of these Rebecca fulgidas that are more mounded, this is certainly more upright in its habit. But what stands out with blackjack gold, a, a mid-sized flower, but those eye, it's huge black a seed head cone on there that really stands out across the garden and the dark stems they have. So a big body plant um, can have a tendency to flop a little bit, but um, if you like that height, that back of the perennial border type Rudbeckia, or maybe one to pair nicely with to lean on other perennials in the bed, blackjack gold's a good option. Thank you. Okay, the next one, Cherokee Sunset. Cherokee Sunset is another seed variety. Um, this is one of the herda species, um, so one of the tender perennials. Um, most people would use a, utilize that more as an annual. Um, kind of what sets this apart is the nice fall colors, as you can see, but really all the blooms are nice and double. Um, this is probably a 24 to 30 inch height, so it fits good for both the crazy cut flower people and the home gardeners looking for something kind of medium height to shorter. Thanks. And I think, Michael, you were also going to talk about cherry brandy. Yes, cherry brandy is delicious looking. Um, they look just as good as that photo, actually probably better in person. Um, colors don't quite stand out in the photo. Um, so it's a single red tone, um, another medium height, uh, 20 to 24 inches. Uh, so plays well in both cut flowers and for bedding purposes. Um, and it's another seed variety of the Herta uh, species. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we have Corona. To me, Corona is just the classic Rudbeckia look right there. I don't know if anybody else has anything to say about Corona. And the next, we you can, can tell we're going in alphabetical order here. Um, there's Dakota. There are several Dakotas on the market. Now, these are vegetatively propagated. Here's Dakota Gold, and then there's Dakota Red Shield. There's several other colors in the series. Um, these are touted for their large flower size. And now, Scott, we're going to toss it over to this Denver Daisy has a really cool story. Yeah, so most of what I'm telling you about today is, is all of these Rebecca Hirta varieties that we offer at Benari. And Denver Daisy is probably one of our most famous ones. Uh, this has gotten more awards and more recognition in the industry and with gardening uh, than any other Rebecca variety that I know of. It's, it's very well known. Um, it's an AAS award winner and, and really has phenomenal garden performance. It is a more vigorous variety, so these, these can get up to, you know, 30 inches in the landscape. Um, but the flower power and the garden performance is just tremendous with this one. You get these nice dark centers on the, the golden yellow flowers, and they just never quit blooming all the way till frost. And isn't it true that um, it was done in conjunction with Denver's Centennial? Or I, I yes. probably messed that all up. Well, we, we have a little bit of history with this one. Yes, with the city of Denver, um, I, I, I don't know if it was some kind of a, a bicentennial celebration or something like that, but they did a big promotion where we, um, we gave seed packets of this variety um, to the city of Denver. They were literally everywhere, every grocery store, garden center, any place that sells seeds you can imagine was just handing these things out and um, did a huge promotion. They were planted all over the city of Denver. So we got some really amazing photography uh, that first year in our launch and, and a lot of publicity. And, and that was a great kickstart for this, this award-winning variety. I always love to hear those little stories. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, okay, next up is Gloriosa Double. This is another AAS winner. Um, obviously double flowered, so you can see those long thin petals there, which is um, a really nice feature. After that, we have Gold Blitz. Yeah, Gold Blitz is a new variety that we launched at Pan American Seed last year. Uh, for those of you that know Goldstrom, that's kind of a staple, and we'll talk about Goldstrom next. Gold Blitz is an evolution of that. So Scott Trees bred this to be earlier in timing. So it will flower up to two weeks earlier than Goldstrom, but give you that comparable, very floriferous, mounded Rudbeckia fulgida from seed that we all know and love. So um, this is again, Gold Blitz earlier to flower. 
And you mentioned gold Goldstrom. Yeah, Goldstrom is, uh, or Goldstrom, depending on how you pronounce it, is, is a very classic Rebecca Fulgata variety. Um, this, this has been around as long as Rebecca has been around just about. It's, it's really a leader in, uh, in that type, but it sometimes has a hard time overcoming vernalization and coming into flower quickly. That's where some of the new breeding has really upgraded this. But th this is a very classic uh, perennial Rebecca Fulgata. Yeah, really a workhorse in terms of Rebecca. You see it in tons of landscapes. It was a perennial plant of the year back in 1999. And I think this um, variety was actually like brought into the world in the 1930s. So talk about a plant that, that stood the test of time. Absolutely. Good, good point. And what I want to point out is that Goldstrom was the comparison when we were trialing American Gold Rush. And the reason that American Gold Rush uh, one is because it outperformed and it was primarily because of that disease resistance. So if, if your Rebecca's, you know, your perennial ones are kind of uh, seem to be getting that spotted spots on the leaves. What is the official name? Is it black spot? Is that the official name? There's black spot septoria. That's it. Um, and then there's um, some other bacterial spots and um, fungal spots as well. So there's a variety of uh, pathology fun that we can get with Rudbeckia, but hopefully not in your area and in your garden. Yes, especially, especially if you try some of the newer varieties. So that was, that was my little tidbit there. Okay, after this one, it is Indian summer. Yes, this is another seed, Rudbeckia hirta variety. Uh, we, we don't supply this at Benari, but I think it's open genetics. It's a longstanding variety um, that, that anyone can sell. And Indian summer is unique because it is a, a tetraploid genetic. And, and what that means is that it actually has a really enhanced garden performance. So this one typically will go later and longer in the garden than, than most of the other varieties. It's a little bit slower to come on to flower, but, but these usually are the last ones standing in the garden. And this one is an AAS winner, as well as uh, some people might not be familiar, but the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. This is a year of flower as well, or one cut flower of the year. Um, this is amazing as a cut flower. You're looking at blooms like six inches or larger, um, and it holds really well in a vase. One of my favorites. Yeah, it's, it's a great performer. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, talk about Maya or Maya. Maya? Uh, Maya, yeah, Maya. after the okay. Mayans. This, this is a uh, really unique one we offer at Benari. It is a Rebecca Hirta, but unlike the other Rebecca Hirtas we've shown you, this has a fully, completely double flower. So um, what you see in the photo, the flowers actually get even more double than that and will actually cover up the brown eye in the center. So you'll, you'll get almost a, a marigold looking double flower on these things. Uh, that's what I was going to say. It almost looks like a marigold or a mom even. So yep. that one's very interesting. Okay, next up is the mini Becky Flame, And this is one of the newer, newer varieties. It's vegetatively propagated. It is a herta. Um, did one of you say that it was a uh, hardy to zone maybe six? Is that what I heard? Hardy to zone six. I feel like in that tender perennial space with most of the um, Rebecca here does. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, next up is Prairie Sun. Okay, so Prairie Sun from Benari, another Rebecca here to variety. This is really a classic one for cut flowers. You can see the, the tall flower stems and the giant flowers. Uh, I started off this uh, presentation talking about Amarillo Gold. Amarillo Gold is like the little brother to Prairie Sun. Um, it's, it's much shorter, but still has that same uh, type of flower. Prairie Sun is the giant one that's great for cut flowers and it's really gonna get much taller in the garden. This was the, uh, the, the original that Amarillo Gold was based off of. And also awesome. an AF winner, sorry, did you say that? I did not, okay. um, but it should be because this is a really, really good performer, kind of like Denver Daisy. Yeah, and Gail has posted a link to that there. So we'll keep you informed on the AES winners, no doubt. Um, next one, Rodeo 
Okay. Is it rodeo or rodeo red? I guess kind of depends um, what kind of culture you're living in maybe, um, but it is a double red. We had a red earlier that was a single. So this one is a double. And then we'll go to Sundance. Sundance is a Rebecca grandiflora. Um, not a Pan American seed product, but one that I've seen and enjoyed in gardens before. And talk about a big bodied, big chassis plant. This is like a four foot tall Rudbeckia. So back of the bed kind of Rudbeckia, very tall and upright. Um, can in age have a tendency to flop. So I've seen these staked before, but you'll notice those reflexed petals, more like an echinacea, how they pull away from the seed head. But they really are pretty big flowers, big showy statement, upright type Rudbeckia in a Rudbeckia grandiflora. And these are na that native range is like Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri. So um, the more, you know, we're getting a little bit more drought tolerance and well-drained soils is going to be a better option for the uh, these type, the Sundance Rudbeckia. So um, you mentioned something that we didn't talk about earlier, and maybe we can just take a slight little detour before these last couple of slides. Um, native, to what areas of North America are the different Rudbeckias native? Is, is that a big, long, complicated answer, <laughs> depending on the species? Yeah, I would say, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. Um, Rudbeckia fulgida, for the most part, is native to eastern parts of the United States. So, you know, eastern seaboard all the way into the, through the Midwest um, and through, you know, southern parts, southeast United States um, is where Fulgida is native. Now, I, I'm not as well versed on Hirta, so maybe Scott um, yeah, can, can take that I think right Hirta is very similar. It is more on the eastern uh, half of the country. And, um, but that said, these things naturalize because they self-seed and everything so easily, they, they naturalize really well. So there, there's a lot of parts of the country where they're very much naturalized, but not technically native plants. Um, so, but I would agree that the eastern half of the country seems to be where most of the Rudbeckias hail from, um, as far as being native plants. And I think um, in our year of article, which um, Gail had already posted a link to, we do list oh, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 of the species. And a lot of them do are, are a little bit more specific. I think there was one um, native to one specific state and I can't remember which one it was now. So if you really want to nerd out on Rudbeckias and exactly where they're native to, we do have that information on our website. Um, but let's go, let's see here, the last- And Diane, Diane yeah. I will just throw out there that, you know, there are some that do live out West, like there's a, an occidentalis species that lives only on the west coast so so it is not exclusive to the east coast yeah yes exactly right yeah so there's a lot of different types for our, every different area so that's that's excellent um scott i think you have the last two that are both yeah. the toto varieties so toto is interesting because um it is one of the only a rebecca Rebecca series on the market. So we have actually three colors that make up the Toto series. This lemon you see here, and then there's a gold and also kind of a bicolored rustic color. Um, we'll, we'll show you, it's actually on the next slide. Um, Toto is a great series because it's really compact and early flowering. So it's one of the most compact Rebecca series or genetics out there. These are gonna stay really small and they're great for pots or small areas in the garden where you don't want them to get too tall. Um, Toto is a really good variety that, that just stays tiny. Excellent, thank you. So if our panelists could take a look at the chat, um, Jane has posted a photo in there of a Rebecca that is as big as her hand, um, wondering what variety, would anybody want to venture a guess on what variety that is? Let's take a look. I would say right off the bat, looks like a here tut to me, based on sheer size of that flower. That was from Jane, you said? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can open it. Yeah, I think that's a good guess. Um, while Scott is looking at this, here's another interesting question is, um, are any Rudbeckias edible? any parts of them, or do they have any medicinal properties that you know of? 
I have not heard of Rebecca thrown around in the medicinal spaces. It's not like, you know, we hear echinacea and monarda and some of these other prairie species um, becoming used for medicinal or edible purposes, but I have never heard. I, but, you know, I could be just out of the know. Uh, if, if there is, let us know. And um, this is this field that you see behind me is gold blitz at my work. So maybe we need to start um, snacking on the, on the gold blitz. Be careful. We're we're not encouraging that unless somebody gets gets information from the experts. Yes. Um, one of the things that we did not talk about earlier, and somebody had asked, is for the most part they're sun loving. Um, are there any that are tolerant of shade? Not really. Yeah, you're you're always going to get better flowering and more flowering with full sun and you know that's like kind of going by what they say for tomatoes at least six hours of full sun in a day you're going to want um rebecca typically is going to perform better during the longer days as well most most of the genetics um especially from seed usually need at least 13 hours of day length to to really bloom um once they've started blooming they can continue going for a while but as you can imagine, in the early spring or late fall, they're they're not going to put on as many flowers. Okay, I think you read the chat and asked the question and saw my the the next question, which was, do the earlier blooming varieties still bloom until frost? So what you're saying is they want the longer days, more sunlight. So as we move into fall and maybe that first frost date, they probably will not be blooming as much. Yeah, usually if you're a grower and you're producing them for sale, you can, you know, have them in the garden center in September. And that's when the days are going to start getting below that 13 hour point. And the consumer can still enjoy them for, or the gardener can still enjoy them for some time before they stop blooming. Uh, so it's going to be like into November or, 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 or later before they really stop. Some parts of the country, you'll have snow on the ground by then. So, um, Usually you can get a good longevity for the fall with them in most regions. And I'm sure Michael is sitting there saying, well, if it looks like it's going to frost, just cut them off and bring them indoors for cut flowers, right? Of course. Always. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, what about water needs for the most part on Rebecca? Do the different species need different amounts of water? Or what do you recommend? There's certainly some more drought tolerant species, but most... Uh, most of the Rebeccas we sell being Rebecca hirta, generally we say it can use like up to an inch of water per week in the summertime, um, whether that's from rain or supplemental irrigation. That, that's a good rule of thumb is, is about one inch per week during the summertime. Yeah, Fulgida tends to be in a you know, similar range, right? They're not heavy water users, but um, certainly could benefit from some irrigation or or um, rain existence to keep them moving. There are some species, like I mentioned, um, a Maxima and Grandif um, Grandiflora, these species native to Texas and Arkansas and the Southeast, you know, that's great for your gravel gardens or your uh, zero gardens or your more drought tolerant spaces. Uh, but most of the, the varieties that we talked about in the presentation today uh, are gonna need some, you know, some decent amount of water. Yeah, usually you'll have to use some supplemental irrigation during the summer to, to achieve that one inch per week. Um, and and, and uh, yeah, on the other end of it, you do, they hate wet feet. So you don't want to overwater Rebecca ever. Um, so. Well, that was going to be one of my questions also is different types of soil. So obviously a clay soil is not going to be good if uh, it's going to be waterlogged. Yes, but the Rebecca here to species is more tolerant of clay soil. Um, so those actually do really well in the southeast in places where you have that hard pan. Um, they can still tolerate it pretty well. And Rebecca's can take really, really poor soil. They, they like good drainage and they like fertile soil because it helps keep them more consistently moist. That said, they once they're kind of take hold and once they establish, they can really take abuse. Um, so. I think that's why we're starting to use, see Rebecca use a lot more in these urban and developed spaces because they're perennials that can just take a beating and keep on going. Um, so we here in Chicagoland, we have it along the um, the Lake Michigan and along the you know our downtown areas, and they're just happy as can be. So it's um, 
a testament to the, some of the breeding work that's been done are just species that are resilient um, in Rudbeckia. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because yes, they are resilient. Um, but this is what I hear time and time again from the breeding companies is what they're working on is to make, you know, no matter what it is they're breeding, we want more flowers, a longer bloom time, you know, drought resistant, heat tolerant and everything like this just to make it easier for us in our garden. So I, I love that, that hopefully our jobs are getting easier for, for the home garden. Um, let's hear, let's talk about, I mean, we, we know that some are propagated from seeds, some Rebecca are vegetatively propagated, but for those of us who are like, oh, I want to do it from A to Z, I want to start them from seed. Are they fairly easy to start from seed? Do you have any tips for starting from seed? Should it be done early in the year? Yeah, I can, I can chime in on this since, since we do so much with seed. The, um, you know, generally six weeks before your last frost is a good time to start sowing. Uh, that, that'll give them enough time to kind of come up and be ready. Um, they're not too difficult to self-sow, uh, whether you're doing that indoors or outside, you know, directly into a, a final pot or even into a prepared uh, garden bed. Um, they, they can be direct sown like that or sown into a tray. Um, we usually recommend for people newer to sowing or who aren't as experienced with sowing seeds to multi-sow them. That kind of gives you a buffer. And if one doesn't come up as well, you have one or two behind it to help fill in. So generally that's a good practice. Um, they're fairly easy to germinate. You just, you know, keep them moist in the beginning stages and you keep that temperature range in the low seventies. And that that's usually a good target. Um, that they're, they're not too difficult to germinate and they will, you know, reseed readily even outside in the landscape. So you'll, you'll have no trouble finding volunteer plants uh, where you've planted seed Rebecca before. Yeah. We also recommend if you are uh, self-sowing, maybe do a light cover over that seed, not to bury the seed, but a light cover really goes a long way in helping um, with uniform germination. Yeah, they actually prefer some light to, to germinate. So if you bury them too deep, that, that'll really inhibit things. And the, the light cover helps with direct sowing out in the garden too, so the birds don't come. What do you suggest as a cover? I was just planting some things outside last weekend. I'm like, what am I gonna do to keep the birds from getting these? In a tray, it would be vermiculate. I don't know what you'd use in the garden if, if that's the same. I hesitate to cover with a ton of soil, um, heavy, just like um, garden soil, because that that might exclude light more than you need. So if you have potting mix, just throwing a little bit of, um, you know, not a soilless peat based or a coconut core based potting mix to go over your seed if you're self sowing right out into the garden, and that might might be a good place to start. Great. Um, do the seeds require stratification? If you're collecting them yourself, then yes. Yeah. Some of the seeds that we do provide are, are primed. So that means that germination process has been started for you, um, but, it, but that radical has not emerged yet. So that seed is ready to go. You don't know, no stratification need if you're purchasing uh, that seed. But yes, if you are collecting with many of these species, stratification will be required. Excellent. Um, are all Rudbeckia perennial in zone seven? Depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are marginally hardy in a zone seven, and I'm speaking most to the seed varieties of, of Rudbeckia hirta. Um, there, there's species that are extremely hardy all the way up into Canada in zone three, like the Rudbeckia fulgata we talked about earlier. That's a very hardy species, but when you're talking about Rebecca hirta, that species is typically restricted to zone seven and higher as a perennial. Um, in North Carolina State did some different tests with overwintering Rebeccas, and what they found in their zone six, they were not confident enough to call it a perennial in zone six. Some plants would make it, but not all of the plants. A lot of it had to do with how well established they were going into the winter. But in general, zone seven is a safer bet. They are short-lived tender perennials, that said. So they're, they're not going to be lasting 10 years in a zone seven uh, either. 
And on the farming side of it, I know we're talking more garden today, but there are people who, who will plant these in the fall into high tunnels or under row cover. So some gardeners get a little creative and try to do that at home as well. And in some cases they can be successful. A cool book is, uh, well, I shouldn't have said that. A great book to read is Cool Flowers that talks a little more about that as well. Interesting, thank you, yes. Um, and just to clarify here, somebody is asking, um, isn't her to the species and not so much a named variety or cultivar? And that is correct. Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, let's see here, where, where was I on my questions? What about deer or rabbit resistant? Do they like them? Are they gonna eat them? Are they not their favorite? Are they the entree? Or are they the dessert or appetizer? They're pretty or, resistant. I, yeah, I don't I would, think, yeah. They, they have really rough leaves and rough stems with these little tiny coarse hairs on them. And I think that's a big deterrent for deer and rabbits. But in general, as a rule of thumb, I like to say that, you know, if deer are hungry enough, they will eat anything. Yes. Um, I did just like a self trial at my parents' house. And uh, we had like fulgida out there, trilobum and uh, hirtas as well. And the, the hirtas were just a little more tender and they were going after those, but they didn't touch the fulgidas as much. Fulgidas also have kind of those woody stems that I assume are not very palatable for, for deer. So take it all with a grain of salt, but I think Rudbeckia maybe isn't their first choice if they've got other options to eat from. Yeah. Okay, if you provide them a buffet, they might choose something else. <laughs> um, I. I think I heard one of you mention something about staking. Um, I, I'm going to make a blanket statement here that, again, another one of the things that the breeders are working on with new, new breeding work is stronger stems so that there is not that lodging and they don't have to be staked. Um, but would you guys like to comment on that? Um, and obviously it's different for like the shorter ones like Amarillo Gold versus some of the taller ones that you might use for cut flowers. Right, species that I've had to stake before, like Trilobum, Missouriensis, Maxima, Grandiflora, but typically none of the Fulgidas I've ever had to stake. I think many of the Hirtas, you, you don't need to stake either. They stay nice and compact. But yeah, we are breeding for uh, stronger stems because that's, a, that's not only a win for you all as the gardeners, but that's a win for us in seed production, right? If at our production farms, they have plants that are falling over, that makes producing seed very, very challenging. So if we can have a plant that stays nice, robust and upright, easier to harvest seed, uh, but then that's a win for you as well at the, as the end, end consumer. Excellent. Any tips on summer care? We started about, we talked about starting from seed and now it's July and they're beautiful. What should I be doing in June, July, August for my Rudbeckia to make sure that they continue to flourish? I mean, you're going to need to provide that irrigation like we talked about before and just make sure that they don't stay too dry or too wet, of course, but um, Fertility is one thing you'll want to consider. They do like a, a good shot of, you know, slow release fertilizer, one in the spring and one, one application in the fall maybe should, should be sufficient. Um, and, and, you know, that deadheading is another thing that is generally a good practice because it's going to encourage more blooming and, and repeat blooming. Um, so we, we typically see that happening during the later summer months also. Yeah. Dead house, deadheading can also be a great practice. To, if you want to reduce that reseeding, then you know deadheading will help you there. But also, I've I've been known to lead those seed heads, and they make for beautiful structure in the winter. These little you know black cone seed heads, just you know when the snow catches them, it really can be quite nice. So it's the give and take to, to deadheading the plants. Well, it, and and the birds love it. You get the the birds visiting those seed heads too. They they love that. Um, birds. Michael, were you going to say something about birds? Oh, the same thing. I was just going to say the birds will love it, having them there. The seed heads, yeah. Um, what about other pollinators? What, what pollinators are they good for attracting? Most of them. I don't know if they attract hummingbirds, but all of the butterflies and bees, um, they're actually known to be attracted to some different beneficial insects as well. Um, yeah, I think hummingbirds 
hummingbirds, not so much, just because of the, the mouth parts on hummingbirds. They don't have those tube flowers here to work with. But yeah. I think Mount Cuba um, Gardens did some research um, with Rudbeckia, and I believe like butterflies particularly, you know, while we have a lot of species that are heavy bee um, attractors, butterflies particularly on Rudbeckia more so than bees. So we talked about um, deadheading, but what about pruning? Uh, the question exactly is, will pruning early on encourage fuller plants with more blooms or is this unnecessary? And I think the answer might be, well, it depends on, you know, if you have an older species or a newer one. So who wants to tackle that? I can chime in. We, we typically don't recommend pruning too much. Um, deadheading, of course, is good practice, but really cutting the plants back is not too necessary unless you're really just wanting to hit reset and get a, a fresher, newer looking plant. Um, you know, may, maybe later in the season, you could cut them back and encourage like a reflush for the fall or something like that. But in general, um, we, we don't recommend it too much. And they do most of their bulking early in the season under shorter days. So typically you would just start them Okay. Earlier, if you wanted a more to have more flowers on it later in the season. Good, good point. And um, oh, sorry, Michael, go ahead. I was going to say, and if you're a gardener and you're not familiar with them, it's a very different plant habit than like a zinnia. Like a zinnia, you may want to pinch to help get it to bulk out, but Rudbeckia has a very different plant. Habit. So I think with what's like Scott's saying, like not needed. Yeah. And. We talked about the good things that are attracted to the plants. What what about any pests or diseases? We did talk about the leaf spot. Um, anything else that uh, might become problematic and how would you treat those? I think downy mildew can also be an issue. Uh, powdery and downy mildew, both on Rebecca. The um, powdery mildew you're probably gonna see in, in terms of the, the white um, fungus sporulation or, um, mycelium happening right on the plant, but um, typically just giving them some space, not overcrowding these plants, getting good airflow in through is going to help certainly, but I know in some of your conditions, it, it might be inevitable to have powdery mildew um, and some of these the leaf spots that we talked about, septoria, um, pseudomonas, bacteria leaf spot, and other fungal leaf spots can be an issue. In general, the thing you mentioned about the, the spacing and airflow is is really important that helps the plants a lot to avoid the disease problems also we see that like any freestanding moisture on the leaf uh, especially going into the evening hours uh, really creates disease issues so we, we recommend trying to water the plants at the soil level rather than watering the foliage of the plants um, because the leaves hate staying wet so try try and keep the leaves dry and that'll that'll reduce your chances of disease so drip irrigation and possibly watering in morning instead of evening, if possible. What about mulching? Um, if you mulch around the rudbeckia, will that help with any of these diseases? I don't have a lot of experience that would suggest one way or the other. I, I think it's good practice to mulch it because you want that consistent moisture that, that'll help with it not drying back too fast or staying too wet. Um, That'd be the biggest advantage of mulch that I would see is, is the moisture management. And what about dividing plants? Here you are talking about good airflow. So if you start to get a rudbeckia that looks like it's just a little too cramped in its space or maybe isn't blooming as well, should you divide when, what time of year, and how often might a rudbeckia need to be divided? Yeah, these are, uh, particularly with like fulgida varieties, they are quite rhizomatous. So I'd say by, you know, even year five, you could be dividing these um, every handful of years. So you can, you can split them up and, and go from there. Yeah, every three to five years is good practice. And uh, I, I think some varieties or species may need it more than others. Um, okay. Michael, I know you're dying to talk about cut flowers. So um, let's talk a little bit about that. You've got 
you've got your home garden and you want to um, plant some rudbeckias for cut flowers, is there a certain height that you look for? Uh, a lot of gardeners, I would say, some gardeners are doing tiny little bouquets, so they're not as worried about it. I always, the bigger the better, but I go crazy with arrangements. So really any of these heights, even the totos um, that Scott had talked about earlier, like they're shorter, but they still would hold in a vase. Um, so like generally I probably wouldn't go, if I'm aiming for cuts, I wouldn't go for anything less than 15 inches, but again, for home garden purposes, they are useful still. So. Okay, any tips on growing for cut flowers? So not so much for growing. Well, I think with what the other guys were saying, just about having space, getting the airflow, all of that, so that you don't have the fun texture of all the mildews and stuff on the foliage, um, which is delicious in the fall. Um, but I would say on the harvest side of it, um, just don't harvest in the heat of the day. Um, make sure your buckets are nice and clean. Um, Rude Becky is one of those ones I've never had issues with hydrating, but some people say that they will drop. So the big thing is don't design with them immediately. You might want them to sit in a bucket in a cool space for a full day or at least half a day. Um, out of sunlight, um, let them hydrate. Excellent. And um, so with cut flowers, Michael, what, what's one of your favorite combinations in a cut flower bouquet? Rudbeckia and? This is fun. Um, I honestly, Rudbeckia to me stands out by itself. Like I love giant vases of just Rudbeckia, but if I'm going to mix like dahlias, zinnias are great. Um, anything that people would want to put a sunflower with, realistically, they, they're a more airy sunflower is kind of how I look at them. Like they have a much, uh, a less stiff texture. Um, so they play well with a lot of stuff, um, especially some of the newer colors, like the cherry brandy, that red, like plays well with others. Sometimes yellow, golden, orange are kind of touchy with some other colors, but there's so many colors out there now that play around. Yeah, that sounds fun. And then uh, what about the annual types or the perennial types? Um, who wants to talk a little bit about garden design with Rudbeckias? Um, what height do you look for for back of the border, front? Uh, what do they play well with? What maybe you shouldn't put them with, if anything? I can't think of those, but any any other tips on garden design with Rudbeckia? Yeah, I would say with the fulgidas and more of these perennial types, I find myself pairing them um, with other partners of the fall. Um, so I've seen it a lot with sedums and Russian sage, perovskia and um, asters and things like that. And then also, you know, great ornamental grass textures um, to really have a celebration in the fall. But also, you know, we can carry this gold color and you can really have gold all season long. Maybe not as good as Rudbeckia gold, but you know, this time of year we have Forsythia and then we can get some gold Echinaceas and Corapsis in the summer. And then we can ring out the season with um, Solidago, Goldenrod and Rudbeckia in the fall. So I think it was as, as long as you pair it with things that are gonna bloom early in the season, right? Because Rudbeckia, we wait, we're so patient on Rudbeckia fulgida, we're waiting for that late season. So if you've got some spring and, and uh, summer bloomers in there to hold down the fort in the bed before they come, I would say that's important. So and I think like in commercial landscapes, I see Rudbeckias a lot with things like begonias, um, with angelonias, with, uh, uh, scavolus things that can really take heat and perform like all summer long uh, because then they can just keep going together. And in containers and in the garden beds, think about them playing well with pumpkins and fall ornamentals that you would have for displays as well. Oh, good point. Yeah, especially some of the like that autumn <laughs> colors one would be fantastic. Yeah. And honestly, like in the middle of a container, a lot of times you'll have a grass or something like that. Put like I've had Denver Daisy in the center of a container as the taller piece, and it's fantastic and not so boring. So. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's that thriller in your combination container. And then I was thinking of monochromatic, you know, as Marcus was talking, I was thinking of a combination container where it's all different yellows, but you've got the tall, the short, the spilling, et cetera. That would be, and it's a cheery yellow. What more can you ask for? That's, that's awesome. Um, are there any questions I forgot to ask about Rudbeckia? Was there something I left off? You got me thinking more about this design questions. And I think um, there's maybe a couple uses that I wouldn't use Rudbeckia. Again, we said sh deep shade. That's probably no go on Rudbeckia. Also like standing water. I've seen a couple applications of these bioswales or these rain gardens where they think, oh, Rudbeckia will do just fine there. I think it'll do okay on the margins, but in that standing water, that's not where Rudbeckia wants to be. It doesn't want those wet, soggy feet. So it, it is a pretty versatile plant. It can handle a lot of urban conditions but it doesn't do everything. Not a swamp plant. Yeah. <laughs> Find something else for your swamp, yeah. Gail just posted a picture of the Rudbeckia with a nice ornamental grass, a uh, purplish grass. I'm, I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but that's a beautiful combination where uh, they, they have it interspersed. So you have tall, short, tall, short, and the yellow mixing with that purplish grass is, is great. Ooh, yeah, Penicetum perhaps. Purple fountain grass. And somebody just asked a good resource for a home gardener to get seeds. And oh, do we have a resource for you? Gail will post a link to it. Um, on our NGB website, there is a link called Shop Our Members, as well as at the bottom of our Year of the Rudbeckia page, we link to all of our members that are selling um, seeds and plants directly to consumers. So um, Gail just posted the Rudbeckia one. We also have shop our members if you're looking for um, any and all types of seeds. I, I think we have upwards of 50 different retail members. Some sell only to Canada, some sell only to the US, some sell both. So uh, we're trying to provide a good service for everybody who's like, I want the newest and I want this and I want that. So there you go. You have those two links. Um, and I, Diana, I just wanted to comment on your previous question too, is the one thing we always are debating back here at Harris is more and I wish more and more people, gardeners especially, would take a look at some of the Hirta types because I think everybody's familiar with the Folgadas. Everybody's seen those, but if once you see some of these Hirta types, like there's no comparison, like I want everybody to grow them because especially like some of the the huge blooms you get on some of them, like they're just, it's its hard to explain, but they're amazing. Everybody should grow. Yeah, we should have pictures of them kind of side by side. So so you can really get the feel and they're yeah. for different uses. I mean, you know, yeah. you've got your perennial bed and, and it's going to be coming back and then you've got the other wow factor, huge flowers. So yeah, that's a good point. Maybe using a, a, few, a few less mums in the fall and a few more Rudbeckia, I, I think wouldn't hurt anyone. Nothing against mums, but um, they are in, oh. in plenty. So <laughs> give Rudbeckia its day too. Yes, exactly. Okay, and um, now somebody is asking the question, if you could grow one, which one would you grow? And this is like asking you to pick your favorite child. I know. But let's have each of you, this is this is a great last two minutes to our webinar. Marcus, you're on screen right now. So I'm gonna put you on the spot first. If you could grow one Rudbeckia, which one would it be? It's a good question. Um, and of course I'm supposed to speak for Gold Blitz, right? It's, it's an incredible variety that you see behind me. And I think it speaks for itself, but as a plant nerd, as a horticulturist, I think I love Rudbeckia maxima the big blue leaves, that height, like unapologetic height, like eight foot tall plants. I think they're just crazy. Such a statement in the garden to have that coarse blue texture and then this big gaudy yellow flower on top. I just, every time I see that plant, I, I nerd out, I get my phone out and they take pictures. So um, I'll, I'll mention that one today, but who knows, come back next year and I might, I might change my opinion. But that's pretty cool. So you picked one of the unique ones. I love it. That's that's great. Um, who else? Michael or Scott, what would be your favorite? I just posted a picture of Indian Summer. Yes. It is by far one of my favorites um, from a cut perspective and the garden. But mm -hmm. like you'll see in the photo and it's just it's delicious. 
So the Indian summer is the one in somebody's hand as a cut flower? Yeah. Okay. So needless to say, your favorite is Indian summer. And that's an NGB board member right there. Yeah, Diane. I can tell who that is. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Scott, now, which one of yours? So or which one? I, it doesn't I tend have to, to be agree with, I tend to agree with Marcus that these giant 10 foot tall ones are just super cool. I'm, I'm a plant geek and, and like that kind of stuff. Um, but for really putting on a show, like all season long, I, I go back to that tried and true Denver Daisy variety we offer because it's it's really a showstopper. It's going to rock any garden you put it in. So I, I tend to like the display that one puts on. Excellent. I'm well, also I, throwing a pop, uh, uh, container image of Denver Daisy in the chat too. Excellent. <laughs> okay, our chat is exploding with these awesome photos. That's really cool. So I a couple of years ago, we painted our house um, blue. It's not that bright a blue, but it's more like a navy blue. And I'm thinking, I need massive rudbeckias in the front of my house. Wouldn't that look awesome? So guess what I'm going to go do? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, my goodness. You guys, I, I love this. You had very good information, very inspiring. Like I said, I want to go out and plant all these Rebecca now. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you.